Are the Doddleston messages fake? Did computers in the 1980s actually talk to farmers from the 16th century? The Doddleston messages are a semi-famous 20th century mystery in which a school teacher in 1984 in the peaceful English village of Doddleston, Cheshire, allegedly received messages from a man who lived in a house on the same site in 1546. These supposed paranormal events were documented by teacher Ken Webster in his 1989 book, The Vertical Plane. The story has subsequently been aired on TV, YouTube and chewed over in many blogs. It is now time to reveal the truth about the Doddleston messages. If somehow these really were messages from across time, what do they tell us about the universe, about time itself and about life? after death. If they were fake, nothing much. But what if the Doddleston messages were genuine? We shall consider the facts and come to our own conclusion. Was the Doddleston incident a poltergeist? In the autumn of 1984 in the village of Doddleston, Cheshire in the northwest of England, Ken Webster was renovating a dilapidated cottage he'd recently moved in. Webster was an economics teacher at the local school and he lived with his girlfriend Debbie, 19, and another friend Nicola Bagley, their long-term guest. Ken Webster appears to be a pseudonym, by the way. Not long after they moved in, weird stuff began to happen. A set of six-toed footsteps appeared to walk up the walls. A cat, maybe? But six toes? Ken, Debbie and their guest Nicola all agreed that it was a joke. They suspected each other of pulling the prank. Ken painted over the footprints, but the following day, the prints came back. Over days and weeks, the occupants of the Cheshire cottage experienced chalk marks appearing, sudden cold spots, a breeze strong enough to lift a newspaper into the air, a feeling of someone being there and later on, noises like footsteps. They found tins of cat food neatly piled in a pyramid and more weird track marks across the floor. It seemed they had a poltergeist. But then there were more mysterious developments. Messages on the computer. Ken had borrowed a BBC computer from his school. He loaned it to his guest, Nicola Bagley, who wanted to be in show business and wanted to use the word processor to write comedy sketches. They left the computer switched on in the kitchen, and when they went back, they found messages had mysteriously appeared on the screen. In his book, The Vertical Plane, Ken Webster sets out the messages received. The first was a rather ominous and obscure poem. True are the nightmares of a person that fears. Safe are the bodies of the silent world. Turn, pretty flower, turn towards the sun, for you shall grow and sow. But the flower reaches too high and withers in the burning light. Get out your bricks, pussycat, pussycat went to London to seek fame and fortune. Faith must not be lost, for this shall be your redeemer. The message is signed L.W. At first, Ken Webster said he thought this was some kind of computer prankster and that the prankster was one of the two women in the house. But as we shall see later, there may have been another prankster at play. A few days later, another mysterious message came through, but this one was written in what appeared to be early modern English. I write on behalf of many. What strange word is thou speak, although I must confess that I hath also been ill-schooled. Sometimes methinks alterations are somewhat barful, for they break many a sleep in my bed. Thou art a goodly man who hath fanciful woman who dwell in mine home. I hath no want to affray, for only sith mine half-witted antic has ripped a twain mine bound hath I been wreathed in a night. I hath seen many alterations last charge house, and thou come home tis a fitting place with lights which devil maketh, and costly things that only mine friend Edmund Gray can afford, or the king himself. T'was a great crime to have bribed mine house. L.W. This guy, Lucas, as they later find out, said he was communicating through a Leems Boist. 
translated as a box of lights. Through questions and answers, the modern trio learned that LW stood for Lucas Wayneman. Lucas told them he lived in a house on the site of Meadow Cottage between 1543 and 1547, during the reign of King Henry VIII. He said he was a farmer and kept livestock around his house. He disclosed he was married, but his wife and son were killed in the plague in 1517. The content of the messages told them that he had been a student at Brasenose College at Oxford University and had met the famous Dutch philosopher Erasmus three times. As the messages went on, it became clear that Thomas could see and hear some of what was going on in Meadow Cottage. For example, he would comment on photos that Webster had left around the computer, like a picture of a Jaguar car that he talked about in a later message. I have found your picture of the cart, but it is a crude thing, for without the horse it won't go far. Debbie, Webster's girlfriend, claimed she dreamed of Lucas after hearing tapping sounds, having her hair pulled, feeling physical pressure, and having a strong sense of being watched while she was alone in the cottage. In a dreamlike state, Debbie could almost be with Lucas in the past, she said, including a time where they made candles together. Messages kept coming up on the computer for 18 months in 1985 and 1986. Lucas Wayneman could also pass messages to Ken Webster via writing on scraps of paper that appeared in, in 1985 at Meadow Cottage. It's not that they survived from the earlier house, it was somehow that Lucas Wayneman used some psychic ability to make impressions on paper in Webster's time. Peter Trinder, a teacher and friend of Webster's, looked at the messages and declared that they were in the early modern English of the Tudor period and that they were authentic dialect and old-fashioned usages that a modern person would not know. Messages from the past and the future too. The story got quite dramatic as the messages continued. Lucas Wayneman stopped writing and an unnamed friend of his took up the story sending Webster messages. It turned out that Lucas was arrested by the local sheriff, Sir Thomas Fowlshurst, because he was discovered to be communicating through this light box. The charge was witchery. Webster later learned that Lucas was released but placed under house arrest. Despite the charge of witchcraft hanging over his head, Lucas continued to write to Ken Webster for many months. Lucas told Ken he was terrified what the authorities might do to him, but still he continued to use the light box and to write on pieces of modern paper and send Webster drawings of things around the house. It turned out that Lucas hadn't been honest when he told him his name. Though he said he was called Lucas Wayneman at first and signed the messages LW, he later revealed that he was actually called Thomas Harden. Lucas Thomas also wrote that he didn't understand why Webster said he lived in 1985. He said, you said your time be 1985, my thought. You were also from 2109, like your friend whom didst bring Leem's boist prey. Then Lucas suddenly announced that the light box was brought to his house by someone called Juan, who held from the year 2109, 2109. Webster was baffled. He wrote back asking who was this person that Lucas knew from 2109. Still curious, Webster decided he was going to use the BBC microcomputer to send a simple message to the year 2109 entitled, simply, Calling 2109. 2109 wrote back. The tale of 2109. The messages from 2109 are very hard to follow. They talk in general New Age terms about higher purposes. This is an example of 2109's messages. The eyes are open, yet nothing do you see. The grey retarding mass is your convict. Quietly, alone he sits in the dark waiting for sentence to be passed and demanding through the eyes of the blind of unspoken questions to answers of ethereal kind. The soul he is the traveller. Chain nor bar can hold him to frail flesh. Here is the ruler of time and space. Here is your God. And another 2109 message. Try to understand that you three have a purpose that shall in your lifetime change the face of history. We, 2109, must not affect your thoughts directly, but give you some sort of guidance that will allow room for your own destiny. All we can say is that we are all part of the same God, whatever he, question mark, is. So now we have a story with people writing from three different dates. Lucas Wayneman from 1543, Ken Webster from 1985, and we from 2109. 
You remember that Peter Trinder was the fellow school teacher who analysed Lucas's old-fashioned language and declared it genuine. But when Trinder attempted to test the messages from 2109, 2109 told him he was endangering the mission they were on. It all sounds like an episode of Doctor Who. Back to the story. Remember, Lucas had been arrested for witchcraft. Ken Webster and friends now had the urgent task of saving Lucas Wayneman from being burned alive. They looked through their history books and found things that Lucas could say to explain himself and get let off the charge. Lucas told the sheriff what Webster had told him to say, but the sheriff was unmoved. He still wanted to try Lucas. Bizarrely, the sheriff, Sir Thomas Fowlshurst, then started using the light box himself to communicate with Ken Webster. He reveals the year where he is is actually 1546. Messages continue from Lucas, who reveals his name isn't Lucas Wayman at all, but Thomas Harden, like we said, who was expelled from Brazenose College in 1538 for refusing to denounce the Pope. After many months of not being executed and continuing sending Webster messages, Lucas Wayman, or Thomas Harden, was told to leave the house, Meadow Cottage, where it was, and he tells Webster that he's going to Bristol to buy a horse to ride to Oxford to see if he can get back into Brasenose College. Why anyone would go from Doddleston to Oxford by Bristol's beyond me. Doddleston to Oxford is 174 miles. Doddleston to Bristol is 169 miles and then a further 74 miles on horseback from Bristol to Oxford. It makes no sense to go 174 miles to buy a horse when your journey is only 169 miles. I'm guessing they had horses in Cheshire in the 1500s and that someone would sell him one. In fact, if you know the story of the Wizard of Alderley Edge, then you know they did and they would. Luke Wayneman then said goodbye, saying he would write a book about his experiences, which he hoped Ken Webster would find and read in 1985. 2109 also said that at some point the book would be found. An academic who wrote about this, a guy called Nicholas or Nick Points, said... If such a book does exist and is ever found, it will be hard to argue against. Nobody has ever found such a book. Ken Webster did some research and found that a Thomas Harden was made vicar of Barrington Parver Parish in Gloucestershire in 1551 and stayed there until 1554. Thomas Harden would not be a unique name, though, and it could easily be somebody else. There were some more highfalutin messages from 2109 and then that was the end of the Doddleston messages. The Doddleston Paranormal Investigation As more questions came up, Webster finally invited a group called the Society for Psychical Research, the SPR, to the cottage to look into what was going on. The SPR's research liaison officer, John Stiles, sent down John Bucknell, who came with a colleague named Dave Welsh and later with Nick Sowerby-Johnson. They didn't believe the story and didn't care as much about Lucas as they did about 2109. They came three times, but each time they left with no answers and having seen nothing happen. Is the language of the Doddleston messages authentic? Peter Trinder was the first expert to analyse the language of the Doddleston messages. Trinder had a degree in English from Oxford University. Trinder was convinced that the language was the kind of language that a person in the Tudor period would actually use, Trinder felt that Lucas's language revealed he was from the southwest of England, not therefore from Cheshire. As we will see, there is a historical trace of a man who might be Lucas Wayneman taking up a role as a vicar in Gloucestershire, so he might have had connections with that area. However, in 1996, another more qualified expert, Dr. Laura Wright of Cambridge University, examined the Doddleston messages. She said the way Lucas put together his verbs differed from how people did so at the time. Wright gave a simple answer when asked if it could be fake. She said, if it's supposed to look like early modern English writing, it doesn't even look close. Wright did a more damning analysis of adjectives which came before nouns. She found that both Lucas's message and Webster's descriptive passages from his book used them almost as often as each other, 26% and 26.6% respectively, while a sample of other writings from the Tudor period used them significantly more at 32-35%. to 35%. It was unlikely that this was genuine Tudor English and it resembled Webster's own English. Anomalies in the Doddleston Messages Lucas says his wife and child were killed in the plague of 1517, I'm not sure where. 
he would be at least 20, if not older at that time. So say he was born in 1495 or so. He's Dean of Bray's Nose in 1538, aged around 43. He's a farmer in Doddleston between 1543 and 1547, so he would be around 52 when he leaves Doddleston. He's perhaps the same Thomas Harden that becomes Vicar of Barrington Parva in Gloucestershire in 1551, aged about 56, and leaves there in 1554, aged 59 or so. These dates actually sound plausible. I thought that being at university at 43 was a little old, but then he was the Dean. Harden Lucas says he got his degree at Jesus College Oxford, which actually didn't exist at the time. Harden thinks that anyone from the future would know that Jesus College didn't exist then. But Jesus College was founded by a group of Welshmen in 1571. Therefore, when Lucas Harden was writing in 1546, it hadn't been built. How could Harden know it would be built? Some years after his death, probably. In an early message, Lucas says he was ill-schooled. This is not a description of someone who went to Oxford University, even one who was apparently dramatically kicked out. In fact, Lucas, as we saw, was said to be Dean of Brasenose College, so pretty well-schooled, in fact. He also said he's writing for many in the first message, but he never says what that means. Who are the many? And then why did Thomas Harden claim he was Lucas Wainman? Might it be that after doing some research, Ken Webster discovered a Thomas Harden who'd been at Brasenose College and was later a vicar in Gloucestershire and so changed the name so it looked like there was historical proof of his existence. If he'd made up Lucas Wainman off the cuff, then he would have been unlikely to find any documentation for a Lucas Wainman. But once he'd found Thomas Harden and changed the name to Thomas Harden, then bingo, there's his facts, there's his historical documentation. Webster, the teacher, got a new job while he was still living at the cottage. This new job was more demanding. And it seems that Webster lost interest quickly in this search for truth and said, I became bored. I wanted to go home and read about something else. At about the same time that Webster got a new job, Lucas, Thomas, said that he was being forced to leave his land. He was never seen or heard from again, but he promised to leave something for his friends, obviously the book. Theories about the Doddleston messages. One clear contender is that Ken Webster and Debbie were the hoaxers. If it was someone else, it's hard to see how they could have done it. Even though there wasn't a lot of security at the cottage, there never was any sign that it had been broken into. Webster was in the house when the messages arrived, so they can't have been planted by someone else. Webster used computers from a pool, so it would have been impossible for him to rig them all. Or for somebody else to rig them all. Also, once the computers were turned off, nothing was saved. So it would have been impossible to plant the information that would show up when the computers were turned back on. There were no hard drives in those days. Or they were, but they were very very rare and expensive. This happened, of course, long before people had the internet. The computers didn't have modems. There was no way to send the message to the computer from another location. So we come back to Ken and Debbie. And remember, though Ken Webster wrote the book, Debbie played her part and claimed weird dreams where she was in touch with Lucas. It seems that they took part in the Out of This World program made about the Doddleston messages and aired on TV in 1996, but apparently nothing since. Ken and Debbie have since disappeared into the rest of their lives. They've never come forward to claim the hoax. They've never really made any money from it either. Lucas and 2109 have never been heard from again. The Doddleston Messages Explained On the surface, Webster's story seems to be a supernatural detective story that tries to find the truth. Who was, is Thomas Harden? Did he even live? Were his messages real or were they made up by someone who knew his sources well? In the book, during the first days of the haunting, if that's what it was, Webster's character spends a lot of time learning about early modern Chester and the surrounding area. While doing his research, Ken Webster found evidence that Sir Thomas Fowlshurst was the sheriff of the Doddleston area in the mid-1500s. This seemed to confirm Lucas's story. But did he find out about Thomas Fowlshurst first, before Lucas mentions him, and only claim that he discovered Fowlshurst after Lucas mentions him? Later, Webster was thrilled when Robin Peedle, an assistant librarian at Brasenose in the 1980s, found Harden's name in the university's records, which again seemed to confirm that Harden's story was true, that he was there. 
I'm not sure if the claim that he was dean of the college was ever substantiated, though. Webster moved from the local school to a job in Manchester, and the story died. No one at that house, as far as I'm aware, has reported any paranormal activity in the years since. Then, we also know that the historical facts given in the messages by Lucas turned out not to be true in many cases. Add to this that a reputable expert is very confident that the language of the messages is not authentic Tudor English and most resembles Webster's own language. The plot of the Doddleston messages with all their twists and turns sounds like the plot of a 1970s British sci-fi series like Doctor Who or Time Slip or Children of the Stones. I think the whole thing started out with Ken Webster playing pranks on his house guest Nicola and then getting carried away with the fun of it. He probably never expected it to go so far and then wondered if there was an opportunity for a best-selling book. After all, novels like The Exorcist and The Amityville Horror had made millions and they were supposed to be based on a true story. Webster wrote his science fiction book The Vertical Plane and thought that claiming it was based on a true story would be the way to up the sales. Conclusion It is my opinion that the Doddleston messages were almost certainly fabricated by Ken Webster and his girlfriend Debbie. They are false, fake and counterfeit. As I work through all these great paranormal mysteries and write about them, they all seem to be based on exaggeration, if not downright lies. And that's a pity, because I want to believe. I'm going to put a link in the show notes to the web page where you can read the transcript and there are links to the various sources discussed, including some YouTube videos of the actual documentaries about the Dolston uh, messages. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please hit like, please subscribe. If you're not subscribed, please share it with your friends. Thank you. I'll bring you another one soon.